takes for a good website um, to start talking about the process of developing it because it, it's not something that you want to just you know shoot from the hip or wing you know you want to follow a systematic process in determining how you're going to go forward in developing your website so we talked about the the, the steps that we're going to take and these are pretty typical steps um, for the analysis and the design again the whole purpose that we do this again is as we indicated in that graph the further along a project goes and you find a problem the harder it is to correct and by harder it, you know that translates to more expensive therefore you want to take the effort to design your solution before you you implement it you want your best shot at at what's going to be an effective solution before you before you go ahead and try to do something you know what what do uh, what's that TV carpenter say? Measure twice, cut once, right? Spend a lot of time thinking about it before you go ahead and and doing it. Um, the other the other reason that we're going to create a design document is if you need to share um, your thoughts on the project with someone. Typically, you as a web developer will be developing your a website for someone else. Maybe someone within your organization. Maybe someone. Uh, from a different organization and you're and you're working in the role of a consultant and therefore you want to sort of get your thoughts down on paper so that they can take a look at it and make sure you're on the right track before you proceed forward in addition in in larger sort of projects you may be actually working with a bunch of or more than one web developer uh, and you want to make sure everyone's on the same page so there's a lot of reasons to go through this process of designing and planning the website um, we're going to follow a model where there's five stages and there'll, there'll be five sections to the document that you will uh, prepare. Just to clarify, because I did have this question in lab last time, what I'm speaking about relates to your semester project. It doesn't relate necessarily to any of the individual labs that we do. All the individual labs we do, it's pretty well defined what I want, whereas the project is much more open-ended where you have to think about what it is that you want to put uh, uh, for your project. All right, at any rate, last time we talked about the first two phases, and I want to summarize that before we continue with the last three phases, and before um, we look at, uh, look at an example document that I prepared. All right, the two phases that we talked about so far are The strategy phase and the scope phase. Um, the strategy phase being where you identify goals. That's what you want out of your website and what you expect your users to visit, uh, that, that are visiting your site, uh, will want out of your website. Remember that for a site to be effective, really, it needs to address both the goals of the organization that's creating the site and the goals of the users that are visiting the site. If it does one but not the other, it's not really going to be a very effective site. All right? They're certainly uh, not necessarily going to be the same goals, but there should be enough um, agreement or, or common ground between the goals of your organization and the goals of the users that you can make a go of it. All right. The other thing to keep in mind when we speak of the users, we ought not think of that as just one group that all have identical goals. There are different kinds of users visiting your site. You know, truth be told, every individual probably has slightly different goals in visiting your site. You know, you can't, however, develop a website for everyone in the world, but what you can do is you can break down into what you think are representative groups. And that's the whole point of making the personas, is to put a human face on it, to say, okay, we have this person that has this background and this is the sort of information that, that, you can, uh, that you're looking for. Um, many college websites, for example, it's pretty obvious who they think their personas are. If you just go and look at their home pages, 
Let's go to Cleveland State's page. You'll see a lot of college websites that look like this. All right. For prospective students, for parents and family, for alumni and friends. Gee, you know, someone must have had this class, then that was their three personas, right? You know, someone that is thinking of sending their, their kid to, to CSU, maybe someone that used to have gone to CSU, and uh, uh, prospective students. Um, it's interesting if we we're going to compare that to our own website. You will also see some personas up here, right? Current students, that's one kind of person that's going to visit the site. Future students, business and industry, community services, and finally faculty and staff. So they also, the developers of this site, also were thinking in terms of what are the different categories of people that are visiting your site. Um, Really, visit a few college web uh, sites and you'll see that they all have really a lot in, in common. And again, th there might be slightly different focuses depending on the kind of college it is, <coughs> but they all sort of address the issue of personas. All right. Student, faculty, parents, alumni, and so on. All right. So that's the strategy phase. That's defining your goals. It's like deciding what it is you really want to accomplish. And it's funny, and again, it almost sounds like, gee, you know, isn't that obvious? And the answer is no, it's not always obvious, you know. Um, and it's important to get that down and to define that as precisely as you possibly can. Uh, one thing I mentioned before is I mentioned about, like, for example, a jewelry store. A jewelry store could have two different goals, all right, um, or two potential different goals. Uh, you might want to sell your merchandise online, or you might want to not sell your merchandise online, but draw people into your store. Based on which of those two paths you choose and which of the goals that you've defined, your site's going to look a lot different, all right, and... For every site, there's little decisions like that. So again, um, you need to think in terms of who's going to be visiting your site, what their goals are, and what the organization wants to get out of the site. All right, that's the strategy phase. That's like why we are here, right? Why are we even making this website? The scope phase is where you start looking at requirements for the site. In other words, you start looking at specific items that are going to help satisfy those goals. All right? Now, each goal might have several requirements associated with it. And each requirement may actually help satisfy several goals. So it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one thing. Um, when you're done, you better have addressed every one of your goals with at least one requirement. Right? If I said my goal uh, for creating a website for a college, let's say, is to make it easier for students to contact faculty, there better be some requirement, something I'm specifically going to put on the site that's going to make it easier for students to contact faculty. Email addresses, a phone directory, something along those lines. The flip side is true, too. Every requirement should relate to one of the goals, all right? In other words, you may say, I'm going to have such and such on the site. If that doesn't really relate to the goal or any of the goals, you might question, do you really need that on the site, all right? And if you don't need it on the site, don't put it on the site. Because keep in mind that the more you add to a site, the more potential you have for making it harder for people to find the stuff that they are looking for. All right, so you think, gee, it might be neat to do this. Well, it might be neat, but does it really serve anyone's goals? If it does, fine, do it. If it doesn't, then forget it. 
Now requirements, um, the way I want to see the requirements phrased are relating to specific content on your site and not relating to what I would call just general good web design principles. For example, uh, a requirement shouldn't be um, that my site will have good navigation. Of course it's going to have good get navigation, right? It, it's not, you're never going to want to develop a website that has bad navigation, you know, with, with, you know, a handful of exceptions ever in history, you know. And likewise, don't make a goal something like people will be able to find the content they want easy. Well, of course you're going to want to make it easy for people to find the content, you know. Is the opposite true? Would you ever imagine maybe making your site so that the content is hidden, all right, and is difficult to find? I know it might look like that when you visit some websites, but that wasn't on purpose, or it shouldn't have been on purpose, right? So therefore, make your goals and requirements specific to the content of the site, not simply restating um, what, what are, in essence, good web design principles. So, when you are done with these two phases, you'll have a statement of the purpose of the site, a statement of the goals, and some personas that are going to be visiting your site. You'll have a, a list of a bunch of requirements. The site will contain biographies of each faculty member. The site will contain uh, information about uh, the different programs that are offered at our college. Um, if we're doing, we're talking about the band website that we talked about before, the site will contain videos of uh, live performances. The site will contain uh, lyrics for the most recent recording created, and so on down the line. That's what I mean by requirement. You have a bunch of these. For the purposes of your site, um, I don't like to give a number, but a lot of students like to hear a number, right? How many requirements uh, that you need? Again, the, the guiding principle is you got to make sure that you cover all your goals and that each goal relates to a requirement. That being said, my guess is that you'll be in the 10 to 15 range for requirements. Well, maybe more, maybe less. Um, it'll be obvious if, if you have like two requirements that you don't have enough, all right? If you have um, 100 requirements, you're probably trying to do too much, all right? Um, so that being said, I'm not going to give an exact number, but I do want you to have a sense of the 10 to 20-ish range, 10 to 15-ish range. If you're much above or below that, then you might want to reconsider and we can talk about it. One nice thing is, is again, um, I, I want you to be ambitious and I want you to, to try to make a really great project, but I also don't want you to, you know, bite off more than you can chew, all right? So one nice thing about projects is it's always possible to either narrow down a project or expand a project, all right? Um, for example, if, uh, you know, you were doing a, if you said your um, project was going to be about sports, right? Well, that's a real broad topic. That's probably too much to cover everything about sports, all right? So you can narrow it down. What's your favorite sport? What's your favorite sports team? What's your favorite athlete? All right. On the other hand, if you you said your site is going to be about, <laughs> I hate to do this because I'm I've been a lifelong Cleveland sports fan, but if you say your site is going to be about recent Cleveland championship teams. <laughs> I'm going to say, well, you might want to broaden that back uh, up a little bit, you know. And, and you might want to maybe go back further in history, you know, because, you know, in the 50s, the Browns had a lot of championship teams, right? So you might want to expand your scope that way. My point in saying this is almost any idea that you have, we can either broaden it if needed, which sometimes happens, but more, more than likely, we can narrow it down to something that's manageable. Because again, I, I want you to do a good job on this, and, and I want you to pick a reasonable size project. I don't want you, you know, writing a million different pages. All right? So, strategy, defining the goals. Scope, defining the specific things that you're going to put on your site. 
that are going to satisfy those goals. The next thing is what's called the structure phase. And what the structure phase relates to is how you're going to carve up those requirements. In other words, how many pages you're going to have. And how are those pages going to relate to each other. Um, they talk about several potential different kinds of structures in the book. They talk about a hierarchy and a network and an organic and all that. For sites this small, typically you're going to have like a hierarchy. You're going to have a home page and then you might have one or two levels underneath that. All right. Um, so unless you have a really good reason, you know, I'll give you that one for free. That being said, I still want you to say why you chose a hierarchy and, and how you're choosing to organize that. One thing that they talk about in the book is what they call an organizing principle. And an organizing principle is, uh, relates to exactly how you're carving up the stuff that's going to be on your site. For example, let's say I have a sporting goods store and I want to list all the products that we sell. What are some ways that I could categorize the different products that I sell? A sporting goods store. Yes. By sport. All right. So. One thing I could do is I could categorize by sport. And that will be my organizing principle. So I could have my home page, and I could have off the home page a page about all my basketball stuff, all my football stuff, all my soccer stuff all my tennis stuff, all my golf stuff. I could then take it a level deeper, and again, what I'm doing is I'm sort of sketching out a hierarchy, and I could say for basketball, there might be apparel and equipment. In fact, for each of these, you could say there might be apparel and there might be equipment. So that would be one way to organize the material or, or, or the, the items on a sporting goods store. What would be another example of how to, to organize the, the, the items or categorize the items for a sporting goods store? Yes. Yep. Start by type of product. So this could be our home page. We could have apparel and equipment. And then underneath that, you could have basketball, soccer, and so on. All right. What's another one? What's another way that we could organize this? Doesn't have to be a good way. All right. We're just brainstorming. We're just thinking of alternatives. OK. Um, you could organize it based on, um, I'm trying to think of a word for that. The, the, the statement was new items, sale items, clearance items, and all that. Um, yeah, uh, inventory status, we'll say. Home page, new items, clearance items. Fail items, and none of the above. Just regular, plain old items. All right, another idea. OK, start off with gender. Male, female. Adult, kid, adult, kid. Another one? I thought I saw someone back there. Yes. Maybe price range. You know. Uh, 
high end, medium, bargain. Now, the interesting thing is I'm just drawing these as one level. You could actually sort of mix and match this, right? In other, in other words, under apparel, that might be the top level thing as apparel. Then underneath that, you could have it by high end, uh, um, you know, middle of the road and, and low end. Any other possibility? Yeah. Season. All right. And again, like I said before, we're only showing one level of this hierarchy. We could mix and match these things. We could have under apparel, we could have it listed by seasons and all that. So we could have winter sports, spring sports, uh, summer, and fall. Now, one nice thing about websites is that it is possible to categorize things a couple different ways. All right, in other words, some websites allow you to look and, and navigate through their site a couple different ways. So one nice thing is that you don't have, uh, you don't, you're not limited to just one view. On the other hand, again, you do want to keep in mind that you don't want to throw too much at your user and make it too confusing. If you give too many options, sometimes users don't know what to do. And you think you're doing them a favor by giving them a million different options, but there might only be one or two options that they want to do. Uh, most of the time, and all the other options that you give them simply causes confusion. All right, so we spent about five minutes brainstorming this, and we came up with, for sporting goods, one, two, three, four, five. Five different ways of organizing the goods for that. And that's not bad. One a minute, all right? Um, if we did this for an hour, we'd have 60 of them, all right? Now, how do you decide which one of these is the best? All right, because we can do them all, but let's say we're going to decide the best way to organize it. Yeah, get feedback from people. Uh, maybe, if you, again, depending on the size of the project and the size of the company, maybe bring a focus group in. Maybe sketch out a couple of prototypes and show people and tell them, you want to take up skiing. Here, find the stuff that you need and have them do that. I've actually talked, uh, I, I did a summer fellowship at NASA and I actually, um, one of the, the speakers of their uh, web development area talked about how they did that at NASA, how they needed a way to organize all the documents. You know, the you know, government loves forms, right? So at any government agency, there's going to be like a million forms. Well, how do you find the one out of the million forms that you want. Well, they got to be organized well, right? And they actually did that. They mocked up two different ways of organizing, or maybe more than two different ways, and they brought people in. And they, they said, hey, you know, let's imagine that you are going on vacation. Can you find the vacation request form? And then they watched the person. And, you know, boom, 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 there it is. Okay, that's good. Check mark, that might be a good way to organize it. If people like tried a few things and no, oh, wait a minute, it's not there, back up, uh, not there. Well, then, then they knew that it wasn't particularly effective. So again, what you do could depend on the size of the organization. Obviously, not every organization is going to have the resources to do something like that. All right, but still, you could talk to people. Um, you could try to put yourself in the head of users. The bottom line is, is you go back to your personas and think. How are they going to view this particular, um, this particular set of data? What's going to make most sense for them? And so your personas might be someone that needs to outfit their kid for um, the, the, the soccer league. Um, it might be someone that wants to take up a new sport. It might be someone who is, uh, you know, who, who golfs a lot and, and wants that. And you sort of walk through and try to put yourself in their mindset and, and see what makes the most sense. Now, for your project, there probably won't necessarily be five different ways to organize it. I mean, something like sporting goods really lends itself to a lot of different alternatives. But for almost every kind of data, you could split it up and you could organize it a few different ways, right? Uh, a college website, you could organize by department. 
or you could organize by whether you're a current student or faculty or whatever. Um, a bookstore. You could organize by kind of book. That is, uh, you know, mystery, not, uh, mystery, science fiction, biography. Or you could organize by um, the kind of binding it has. Is it a hardcover book or a paperback book? All right. So there's alternatives for everything. What I want you to do is consider at least a couple alternatives and come up with the best way to organize it. And then document it through what's called a structure chart. And all a structure chart's going to show is kind of what we very briefly sketched out, how many pages you're going to have, and how it's going to be organized. So I have my home page. Let's go back to our band example. The band's biography, let's say, music samples. videos, pictures, lyrics, maybe for different records you could have a separate page for each or something, all right? That's what I mean by a structure chart. You're going to decide how many pages you're going to have and how they're going to be laid out, you know? and how you navigate to them. Yes? Well, yes. That would be a, a more involved sort of chart. For example, you might have a case like this, where let's say, um, let's say you had like cross trainers shoes. All right. You might be able to get to that product from a couple different areas, and you could show it like that. In other words, this could be shoes, and this could be running, or something like that. So you might be able to get to it uh, from more. Now, my point is, is that's one thing the web is great for, is giving you multiple ways to get to the same thing. What you do want to be careful for is, um, is uh, not overwhelming the user with options and how to get it. Make sure it's very clear to how to get there. To be sure, um, you know, the larger you get, the bigger job this becomes. All right, and this could become a mammoth job. Uh, there's a whole uh, area uh, called information architecture that deals with this, deciding how to break down big pieces of data into logical groups that people can go through and find. You know, they, they deal with what are called taxonomies, which are things like, you know, like, like how the animal kingdom is, is uh, categorized. You know, you, ha you, have, you know, you have vertebrates and invertebrates. Underneath vertebrates, you have birds and crawling things and mammals and, and other stuff. You know, and then it breaks down, goes all the way down the line, you know. Um, so yeah, this, this can get to be very complex when, when you're talking about larger projects. And it definitely is possible to provide multiple paths to the same data. But again, you, you do want to have in mind not to overwhelm the user with that. The other thing that often is done is that in addition to the hierarchy you have, you sort of have a wild card of a search function. So for example, if I can't figure out how to, you know, you know let's just pick some odd sporting good, uh, a wristband, you know. Where would I find a wristband? Well, you could wear a wristband playing baseball. You could wear one playing basketball. Gee, is that really apparel or is that equipment? I don't know. You might give a search. You, know, you search wristband and boom, it shows you up where it is. And that's sort of, it's like the wild card that, you know, 
So again, absolutely this can become a mammoth task for bigger sorts of projects. The hope is for the projects that you folks are doing, you'll have a pretty straightforward hierarchy with maybe a couple of levels on it, two or three levels on it. All right. Next uh, area is what's called the skeleton. All right. The skeleton is where you develop what are called wireframe documents. Now, what's a wireframe document? A wireframe document is a document that's going to show sort of the overall structure of a website. You know? It's not going to show the details, but it's going to show the overall structure. For example, maybe my wireframe looks like this. I have a banner going across the top of the page that says who my organization is, Zeller Sporting Goods, or something like that. I might have, going across the top of the page, my main navigation to get to the different main areas of my site. I might have a sub-navigation here that changes depending on where I go in the site. In other words, if I'm in the shoe section of the site, maybe the sub-navigation says golf shoes, basketball shoes, running shoes, and so on. If I'm in the apparel section, maybe it has, uh, you know, men's tops, men's bottoms, and so on down the line. All right? Then I might have my main area where the, the, the bulk of the page is, the bulk of the content of the page is. Now maybe I have a little area over here that's the sale, sale item. Maybe to just throw a uh, you know, a, a, an additional item in, in the face of the user, <laughs> all right? So, gee, you know, search for shoes, you know, I'm buying some new shoes. Oh, yeah, I could probably use some socks, too. So maybe on the shoes section, I'd have a link to a uh, sale item for socks. And then I might have something down here like a copyright notice or some lesser used links. like maybe my store's privacy policy, something that you want on the site, but, but people aren't necessarily going to view every day. That's an example of a wireframe. All right. Notice I don't say any details. I don't say what the links are going across here. I don't say what the links are going across here. I don't necessarily describe what the banner is going to look like. I don't put what items I'm going to put here. And I don't spec, uh, 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 I'm not very specific about what's going to be down there. I've just drawn big blocks and showed in big block terms how my page is organized. Now, let's look at let's look at Let's look at a website, and maybe we'll think about how the wireframe for their site is. All right. Here, let's go back to Cleveland State's website. All right. The wireframe for this set of pages probably looks something like this. All right, sort of remember what that looks like. We have a banner. We have our main navigation. We have a search area. We have some, I'll call this a special navigation. And then we have 
a sub-navigation, and then the content area. So let's go back and look at it again. Here's the banner, main navigation, search area, couple of special links, sub-navigation, and content area. Let's look at academics. Looky there. It's the exact same structure, right? Banners on the top, main navigation, search, special links, a different sub-navigation, so the specific content is different, but the overall skeleton or structure of this page is the same. And likewise, if we went under and in a content area. Then if I went under research, all right, same thing. All right. What is that? <laughs> I'm afraid. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to academics. The point is that all these pages fit sort of the same format. And if you go on a website, almost any website, you'll notice that the specifics might be different, but every page sort of fits a certain structure, certain certain format. And this is, uh, you know, let's go to Amazon and and look at something. Let's go and look at All right, here we'll let's look at a book. All right. There's a banner, there's some options on the top of here, there's information about purchasing it. Twenty four seventy nine for a Kindle version. That's less robbery. All right. There is, again, there's frequently bought items. There is reviews and so on. We go to another page. The specific content is different, but the same format is used. The same template, if you will, is used. So another way of saying wireframes is to say template. All right. It's the, it's the basic format that your pages are going to take. You don't have to get specific about what's going to be in any of them, but you just, define the, you just define the basic format. Now, it's possible to have more than one wireframe per site. All right? In other words, not every page is going to necessarily look identical or have the, same, or have the identical structure. What's very typical is for um, some pages to follow one format and then maybe some other pages follow a different format. So you might have like a couple different formats. Again, let's go back to CSU for a second. I thought maybe as we clicked around here, there'd be a different format. But really, there isn't. Oh, for, OK, for this page, there's a different format. I don't know what I clicked on even. But most of the other pages all sort of fit that same format. Let's go to contact CSU. Even that one does. What about my CSU? All right, these pages look a little different. My point is, though, is there's not, it's not as though there's a, a, there's a different wireframe for every page. For a site as small as you're doing, you very well might be able to get away with just having one wireframe. All your pages might fit the same structure. Or maybe two wireframes. Maybe your home page looks one way and all the rest of your pages look another way. You know, maybe your home page follows one structure and the rest of your site follows a different structure. All right? Or maybe most of your pages look a certain way, but you have a photo gallery page. And that has a different structure than the rest because it's a little bit special, you know, and you decide to organize things a little differently. 
So you'll have at least one, right? And you might have a couple. If you start getting beyond two or maybe three, then maybe you need to think about it more or talk to me about it. Because maybe you're having, uh, maybe you're not really understanding what you need to do with this. Because for as small of a site as you're developing, one or two ought to work. Three, maybe. Four or five, well, you might not be understanding something correctly or, or doing something correctly. All right. One very common design goal is to have all your pages have a consistent look. Right? If you go back to Cleveland State, they do a great job on that. Pardon me? Well, if they're smart, they give you some, some cues to that. You know, by doing things like that. That one's obviously different. That's a PDF document. All right, this one has a slightly different look. Why is it that I tried to find a page that looked different before and I couldn't? Now that's all I can find. Yeah, right. Um, it, it, if it's a large enough site and if that's a risk to like people get lost where they are sort of in the hierarchy of it, that's why they have many sites have what they call breadcrumbs that show you how you got here. So for example, this might say Office of, uh, uh, Office of Admissions about CSU. That way you know, hey, I'm in that section. Or what they can do uh, via CSS would be maybe to highlight this link and say, you know, notice all these links are the same color. We're in the admission section over here. All right, you can make that a different shade of green, and uh, you know, or a totally different color, and that would really highlight, hey, that's where I am. So there's things that you can do in your navigation to give your user cues as to, hey, this is where you end up. Uh, I've heard it said that good navigation is where uh, you let people know where they are, you know, where else they can go and where they've been. And there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. You can do that with, again, what I said, breadcrumbs. You can do that by styling the page. Uh, you can do that by putting titles on the page that reflect that. Uh, for example, when I develop a site, I will almost always try to make the title match the name of the link that got them there. So they did that in this case. I'm not sure if they did it in other cases as well. So for example, the link that got them there says admissions. I'm not going to say here office of admissions because that has a potential for confusion. I'm going to say exactly the same thing in both places. So yeah, that, that can be a concern uh, that, that you, know, you lose something. And, and you do want to give the user sort of visual cues as to where they, where they are in the navigation. So wireframes, drawing just like this. There actually are tools available, if I'm not mistaken, to help you draw them as well. Someone pointed one out to me a while ago, and I unfortunately may not have recorded what the link was. tool that allows you to go in and drag things around and, and sort of visually come up with that. In addition, and, and again, this is sort of what the, what the wireframe can show.
period of 10 completely free. I always love when people say completely free, right? Uh, I, I heard a joke on one comedy show where they said, it's free after you pay for it, right? OK. Um, at any rate, um, doesn't have to be fancy. You know, you can hand draw it, provided that you can scan it in or take a picture of it or whatever and get it to me some way. All right. Remember, the purpose of these documents aren't to make pretty documents. The purpose of these documents are to communicate. So, so a, a handwritten one that shows and conveys information is better than one that looks nice but isn't really meaningful and doesn't really explain how the site's going to be or how the pages are going to be carved up. All right. Um, you, I'm sure you could do something about this in Word using the, the Word drawing uh, capability as well. All right. That brings us to the last phase, and that is the surface phase. And this is what most people talk about when they talk about web design. In other words, what the specific pages are going to look like what colors I'm going to use, what fonts I'm going to use, what pictures I'm going to use, and so on. This is not represented by a document, but this is represented by creating a prototype, right? Create actual web pages that, uh, or a sampling of the web pages that um, are not necessarily 100% complete, but are complete enough to give the user an idea and to give everyone an idea of what the finished site is going to look like. All right. Prototypes, you might use Greek text, like I talked about before. Because maybe on the biography page for a faculty member, you don't have their biography yet. So you mock one up by putting Greek text in. All right, maybe. Um, now, for this assignment, I want you to mock up three pages. So they don't have to be 100% complete, but they should give me an idea of what your project ultimately is going to look like. I do want to point out, again, as I talked about last time, the sample document that um, I created. Because uh, I, I got a number of questions from students of exactly what was expected. So I decided, well, I'll make a sample document. This is just meant to be a sample. You certainly don't have to exactly do it the same way that I do. but you do need the same sections and so on. So let's go and look at this. In the project folder, there is a sample plan that we can open. Take a minute to look at this. I'm just going to sort of run through and hit the, the highlights. Here's my strategy section where I define the goals and I define the user goals. Here are my personas. I actually show pictures of people and make up a fake biography for them. That should be more than just an exercise. You should actually, when you're thinking and you're, when you're trying to make decisions about how you're going to organize your site and so on, Put yourself in these people's shoes and try to think, how is the site going to make uh, sense to them? Here's the requirements. Again, that address the goals. I could even write the little number for the goal next to it is a good idea to make sure that I have all my goals covered and that each requirement relates to a goal. There's my structure chart. I chose to break it down by musical instrument. And I give a reason why. All right. Essentially, I say that some of my other options might be to break it down by era, you know, by time frame, or to break it down by style. But since my site is geared to newer listeners, they may not really know like different eras, you know, or know the names of different styles. But my my statement here is. Even the most, you know, 
beginning listener is going to know that, hey, that's a piano, and I like piano music, so I'm going to go and look in that area. So that's my rationale for dividing it that way. You should do a similar thing. Figure out how you're going to break down your information, and then present why that's a better way, or, or what you chose is a better way than maybe what some of the alternatives are. There's my wireframes. And my prototype, I'm not going to do, again, you don't have the luxury of saying that. Well, you do, you just will get the points off for that section. Really, the next couple of classes will be devoted to developing a prototype. In other words, we're going to take a design, a wireframe, and create some prototype pages from it and go through the exercise similar to what you're going to do on your projects. Yes? Potentially. Again, there would potentially be a focus group. You could do something along those lines. Sure. The question was, could you use a real person as a, as a, as a persona and bring them in? Yeah, potentially. Right, and, and I, I was just going to say, you, you made that, that comment before. What, what um, you know, again, based on the, the resources and the size of the project and all that, um, yeah, absolutely. Could even be someone within the organization that isn't involved with the project. Although you really have to be careful for that. Uh, the idea being that people inside the organization are going to know something about the organization and aren't really going to be representative of that. So that might not be the best idea. All right, other questions, comments? All righty, we'll see you over in lab. <laughs>